This conference will now be recorded. Um, so yeah, my name is Gary Ewan Park. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer at Chocolatey Software Inc. Uh, I've been working full time on Chocolatey for almost five years now, uh, but prior to that, I was involved in the open source uh, project as well. So I've been on, involved in Chocolatey for quite a while now. Oh. Hey, my name is uh, Paul Brodith. I'm the Technical Engineer Manager at Chocolatey Software. Um, my, me and my team are responsible for the Chocolatey products that you'll all be using. Um, and similar to Gary, uh, but not quite as long, I've been working with Chocolatey now for about four and a half years. Okay. So today we are going to talk about uh, what is Chocolatey. We are going to talk about what Veeam in combination with Chocolatey has to do. And we will have a small demo and then we have room for questions. So first, what is Chocolatey? Paul, tell me, what's Chocolatey? You've, you've dropped me on this one, uh, Maurice. I told me to greet Gary. I was going to pick this one up. Uh, so, <laughs> so chocolate is a software. I'm just going to read this and then I'm going to chocolate is a software management solution that allows you to manage 100% of your software anywhere you have Windows with any endpoint management tool. But what does that really mean? Well, chocolate is the package manager for Windows and it allows you to manage your software, but it allows you to manage packages primarily. Um, and inside those packages can be software, can be things like license keys, can be scripts, can be zips, can be a whole sort of things. I like to call them the payload. So whatever's in that package, um, it will uh, put onto your machine and then it can run uh, PowerShell scripts in order to do things with, for example, the software. You can run the installer, you can customize desktop icons, you can do all sorts of, of cool things inside that package, and as uh, we've got on the screen there. If you've used Linux, uh, you'll be familiar with AppGet, Yum, Pacman, DNF, and the other 4 billion other package managers that Linux has. Um, there's Homebrew for Mac. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it works in a similar way to to those but um windows doesn't have a native package manager hence why chocolatey was actually born so you would say it's actually magic it, it is magic and when you've we've spent your life I've, I've been in it now for be 31 years um almost 32 years uh, i've been working in it but i've been working with computers for an awful lot longer than that but anyway when you download software and you've got to click next 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 100 times to actually get it to install um and then once you have to update am i jumping i'm jumping ahead in these slides it's like we've prepared this <laughs> like we actually know. but um you know once you've clicked next 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 that hundredth time and then when the, you have to update your software, you have to go away and click uh, download the installer for the updated version and click next, next, next again every single time for, well, for example, I've got 186 packages on my machine here just now. So let's just say um, 150 of those are software. So I've got 150 applications on my machine. That's 150 times I have to update them. Um, if you can do all of that. Um, from the command line, automated, silent, non-interactive, and it's repeatable. Um, and it works mm -hmm. the first time as it does the hundredth time, then that to me is a massive time saver. Yeah, so yeah, like like it says here, you can do way more than just Paul just mentioned. Um, like test your deployments um, or or deploy to a supported version or and track the, the, the installation with that's a license, I think, version. Um, so yeah 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 I, I mean as i kind of touched on a little bit that you know I, i'm talking about from a home user or, or a, mm -hmm. an organization's point of view and managing that software but as you said there's that automation part that's built into it as well mm -hmm. that you can you know automate that deployment of software mm -hmm. onto your agents onto your servers onto your can be your desktops your, your end user desktops as well yeah what what is it trying to solve gary that's a very good question. Uh, so yeah, what is Chocolate trying to solve? It, one of the uh, predominant things that uh, Chocolate is trying to solve is that the Windows ecosystem, the Windows software ecosystem is is vast. Um, it was originally designed or traditionally designed with 
uh, windows in mind. So uh, as Paul said, you you a, a window pops up, you click next, you read another screen, you click next. So it's very much uh, initially it's driven by uh, visual interfaces, uh, and th that's predominantly shown when you're you you look at uh, installation packages. And because there's so many different ones, so if you jump to the next one um, after you show, yeah. Uh, so Windows installers are hard, right? Um, and there's little to no consistency for those Windows installers. So uh, there's over 20 different ins installer formats with thousands, literally thousands of different installers in the wild. Um, some uh, applications are uh, distributed in, in zip files or other archive formats, not in an MSI or an EXE. Uh, some software installers are just messy in the sense that they drop files all over the place. Uh, they'll make multiple registry entries, all those things. Uh, it's literally like it's the Wild West. There's lots and lots of different um, ways that you can yeah. get software onto uh, a, a Windows uh, installation. Um, yeah, we, so all, as we all know that... that big blue background and the, and the white letters on top from the installer but way yeah. back in the days um you see them sometimes in the wild currently it, it's like you say it's the wild west yeah so an example of that and can i walk through how this before i say too much more i like paint.net i use paint.net but its installer is kind of a prime example of what happens on a Windows system. So if I wanted to install paint.net, maybe the first thing that I would do is I would go to the website that is paint.net because there's a natural assumption that you go to paint.net and you'll get the installer for the application that is paint.net. Right. But if you try, if you try that, that won't work because somebody else actually owns the paint.net domain and it's parked so that you can't get to it or the owner of paint.net hasn't purchased it. So what you end up doing is you end up Googling for it instead. So you go to Google, you type in paint.net, and then you get the second or third uh, download link there that will get you to get paint.net. So then you go to there and you go to the website and you think that it might be the big green button that you need because the big green button is normally the big button that you always need, uh, but it might be the blue one, but is it actually the blue link at the top? It's hard to know from the website layout what you actually need to download. Um, so when you actually figure that out, you'll get, click through to it and you'll get the actual download link. But is it this version or is it this download mirror that you want to use? It's it's difficult, right? It, it's, it's difficult to know what you actually yeah. want to download. So then you get to actually the download page and you say, well, I'm going to go and download it. Um, and that's great. So then you get to the next page, I think. And the next page actually has the link, but it also has the advert for the desktop I actually took those screenshots. Those screenshots were taken <laughs> at the time that I was trying to build a stand-up desk. So that's why the ads on the page there are for a stand-up desk. Uh, but you eventually get to the download link. And then what you have to remember, though, is because it's a zip file, you have to remember to unblock that zip file, because otherwise you won't be able to open it because it contains executable files. And those executable files won't open or be executable unless you unblock it. So you have to do that. You have to extract the files. Then you have to run the install. And then once you're on the install, you get to the point at the end of it and it tells you, well, you can't install this because you actually need to have .NET Framework 4.7 installed. Um, and then yeah. you're just like, I've done all that work. Is there not a better way of doing all of this? And in our opinion, in our humble opinion, the better way of doing that is Chocolatey because as Paul mentioned, or it was on the slide earlier, uh, Chocolatey actually handles all the dependencies for an application. So if an application, yeah needs the .NET Framework installed or a specific version of the .NET Framework or a specific version of Java to be installed in order to run that application, Chocolatey through its uh, metadata that you can attribute to a package will handle the installation of all those dependencies as well as the actual application that you're trying to install. So like I say, that's what we think is a better way of doing things. And what I've just described can be, in terms of the kind of standard workflow, is literally Choco install paint.net or Choco upgrade paint.net if you've already got it installed, uh, or if you need to uninstall it, then you do Choco uninstall paint.net. So all of those next, 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 all of those going off the websites, finding what you need to download, et cetera, all of that work is kind of taken away from you and you just do the Choco install, a single consistent command for getting all those applications or packages installed onto your machine. So to be sure, adding a layer of chocolatey. Right? Are you taking this one, Paul, or am I? Uh, 
had in a layer of chocolate. Where, well, let's see the next slide. <laughs> so, adding a layer of, of, of so it's sweet, sweet chocolate. So you've got that nice cake, right? And then you've got the nice chocolate icing on top of it. The chocolatey icing, it's quite thick as well. It's a little bit soft and it's nice and sweet. That's chocolate. So chocolate is just the, <laughs> the icing on the cake. Um, but same software management, exactly. So, I mean, chocolate will allow you to manage that whole software lifecycle for you, all of your kind of installs. So as Gary mentioned, your MSIs, your XEs, your ZIPs. Um, I also mentioned um, you can have PowerShell scripts. You can have any kind of scripts, to be fair, but uh, you know we tend to use PowerShell more often than not on Windows, so we talk about PowerShell scripts. Registry keys is another one. Uh, license keys, uh, we actually use, if you've got the licensed version of Chocolatey, we actually use Chocolatey to distribute your license keys. So when you renew your license for Chocolatey, you can distribute the license key to all of your end clients. Um, and you can obviously do that for other software as well. Um, so that's a bit of, of dog food in there. Um, so, um, but, sorry? There is a question in chat right now oh, from that? Eric. Um, he is asking, how does Chocolatey compare to Winget? Well, that's probably, that's a very big question. Can we pick mm -hmm. that one up at the end? Um, we will pick that up on the end. Yeah. yeah Eric, we yeah. will come we, back we to get your question that. at the end. Yeah, we, we get that one quite a lot, but I think it's, it's a big answer and it's not something that we could answer and, you know, very uh, do it justice while we're doing this. Um, but the PowerShell commandlets that you've mentioned there as well, that simplifies the work when you're doing and say uh, when you're creating your package. So your packages um, contain PowerShell scripts. So you'll have an install and an uninstall and what we call a before modify script. So that runs before uh, the upgrade and before uninstall. So it'll do things like um, stop services, um, kill processes, that kind of thing before it does uh, the install, of the, uh, sorry, before it does the upgrade or the uninstall. But there's, we have PowerShell, chocolatey PowerShell helpers that will help you install um, your, your XE, your MSI installers and, and put death, uh, icons on the desktop and things like that. So that helps you in your packages. Um, and since but the one new version, even pre and post hooks hook scripts um yes that that's that's a topic on its own but what they effectively <laughs> can do is they will run at different times when you're installing upgrading or uninstalling a package um so that you can do things prior and po it's pre and post those installs as well um and one of the the the, the, the kind of introduction to that is um clean making sure that packages don't put icons on your desktop so it runs a script before you do any installation that are upgraded or uninstall, checks what icons are there. And after it's finished, it makes sure that the icons that were there are still the only ones that are there. And some installer hasn't just popped an icon onto the desktop. That's it can be done with hook script. Um, but that is that's an entire webinar in itself. Um, but one of the things that Gary mentioned was packages, he didn't actually say these words, but this is effectively what it is, packages being independent building blocks. So taking paint.net as an example, you know, you do, you run through that installer, you finally get it downloaded, you run through the installer and it says, you actually need .NET 4.7.1, yeah. Whereas in the package, what you can do is rather than bundling .NET 4.7.1 with all your applications, because that, you know, that's a commonly used thing. So what you do is you build a .NET 4.7.1 package and then you make sure your paint.net package takes that as a dependency and that dependency will, uh, says oh i need .net 4.7 to be installed before i install paint.net let me install that first for you um so you can use these common common packages if you like uh, rather than putting everything into the one package um and configuration management tools that's we integrate with i want to say every single configuration manager out there um, that's probably a huge, um, a huge number of configuration managers, but we have native integration um, where we've got Puppet, Ansible, Chef, I'm going to miss one, DSC. Um, we have native integration for those, but if you don't have native integration with your configuration manager, SCCM, for example, you can uh, run Chocolate as an executable. It's the same in Intune as well. We have Intune integration in Chocolate where you can run Chocolate as part of Intune. Um, and you you know you run the chocolate.exe that command line tool in there rather than it being um, having native integration. So even though that's not there, you can still use it. Um, and those business friendly features as well. We've got um, package internalizer is a common one that we talk about. And what that does is your package, for example, Google Chrome is always the example I use. 
when you install the Google Chrome package, it will uh, goes away to Google, downloads Google Chrome installer, brings it down on your machine, installs it, etc. Um, part of the internalizer is it takes Google Chrome, puts it inside the package, and you can then use that package inside your organization, put it in your organization's repository, and that package then becomes portable. You can just give it to anybody that has chocolate in it without a need for an internet connection. So AirGap Networks is perfect for in, in that sense. Um, and Another there's many, I, many other features as well. One that I really like myself is the, is the sync feature um, that allows you to synchronize all the in installers that you currently have already on your computer with chocolate packages that are, that are already available and, and, and make new packages directly from those installers that you already have on your machine. Yeah, that, that allows you to be able to, uh, you don't have to start chocolatey with a fresh machine and install all your yeah. package with chocolatey. You can have a machine that's had the, you know, someone clicking next, next, next on there, or you installing it through a different installation method, yeah. and then bring chocolatey in and be able to synchronize those packages that are, uh, sorry, that software, exactly. the same programs and features with your chocolatey packages as well. So. Yeah, so yeah, the approach of, of, of chocolatey, uh, Gary, that's, that's, but like you said before, it's simple. It's it's making it easy, right? I mean, that, that, that's one of the main tenets of Chocolate is it's it's attempting to make it the the, the chaos. It's to try to simplify the chaos. So where we've gone from, is it an MSI? Is it an EXE? Is it a zip file? Is it somewhere I'm downloading? It's Choco install, Choco upgrade, Choco uninstall. So that it it centralizes all of that into a single concrete set of uh, commands that uh, is then the same regardless of what you're installing. Um, yeah. The the other one there is it's decentralized. So well, I think we're going to come on to this, but most folks use Chocolatey using the Chocolatey community repository, where uh, most of the packages that Chocolatey uh, consumes comes from there. But if you're working in a an air gap network or uh, your organization or company doesn't want to use the community repository you can absolutely take those packages internal uh, to your organization and consume them from there so you can get them from multiple places you don't you're not tied to the chocolate community repository um, it, most of uh, the scripting that happens within chocolate is powershell so it's the the windows automation tool so it makes sense that the the windows package manager that is chocolatey uh, uses PowerShell as its uh, base language for doing what you want to do within the package. Uh, it's entirely flexible in the sense that you can make a chocolate package to do whatever you want. Uh, one example that I always use is I use Git version control system. Git has a myriad of different configuration options that you can set up. I put all of those configuration options into a chocolate package. So when I set up a new machine, I do choco install git 13 git config. So that's my package. I own that package, but that means I don't have to remember where all of those things are, uh, why I set them up. I just do a choco install of my package and then git is configured the way that I want it to. Uh, it's secure by default, uh, or at least to, uh, to the best of our knowledge it is. Uh, all the packages are uh, scanned and uh, moderated that go up in the community repository. So you've got security from that point of view. <laughs> And we do our uh, level best to ensure that the actual operation of chocolatey is secure by default as well. And uh, also, we, we like to think it's reliable in terms of uh, once you have a package and you know it installs on one machine, you can then reliably install it on other machines uh, within your environment as well. Uh, so yeah, that's the overall approach of, of chocolatey. Yeah. Like like you mentioned before, that uh, everything is moderated and everything is scanned. Um, yeah, that's that's that would be the next slide. But yeah, you were you were too too fast. But yeah, the community repository, uh, basically the source um, of the packages for for all of people. Um, like I said, I'm I'm a community moderator as well, so I'm one of those moderators that uh, moderate the packages that are out there. Um, and uh, yeah, everything is scanned through virus Total, um, and um, if possible. Um, and you can find the link on, uh, on, the, on the screen where you can find the community packages. Um, uh, we do need to mention that uh, organizations should not depend on this due to trust, security, bandwidth, and restriction. There are things in place that if um, an IP address uh, does too many requests on the community repository, it can get blocked at one point. So. Okay. 
Uh, the community repository, yeah, uh, as of yesterday, um, there were almost uh, uh, 10,000 unique packages. Um, that means that there are 10,000 different packages doing different things currently on the community repository. Um, over, uh, I hope I say it correctly, 2 billion downloads over all the packages. And yep. um, seven around uh, uh, more than 7,000 packages are known good. That means that they are checked through all the systems. They are um, checked that they are still installable on, on the machines that are fire scanned and, and, and all, all kinds of stuff. Um, so a, a, a bit of two, 2,000 packages are either unscannable or un, uh, not, not inst automatically installable on the, on the um, test environment because they need a reboot or something, right? Okay. Essentially, I mean, there, there's, there's all sorts of options why, all sorts of reasons why a particular package can no longer be installed simply because, mm. I mean, the, the download might not be available anymore. So, but what we, yeah. what we, uh, the system that we have will um, periodically check the installs of those packages to ensure that they're still working and known to be working. And, and shows that, that number on the website. That, yeah, that number will fluctuate as uh, our systems come into play and then uh, some packages come and go. I mean, a, a package that exists or a, an application that exists today may not exist tomorrow. And there's very little yeah. chocolatey as an open source uh, product can do of it. Exactly. So uh, hosting your own package repository on your for, for your environment or for your own packages that you created, that can be any kind of repository um, of, or a lot of kinds of repositories uh, like uh, Artifactory or Nexus on your on your Synology NAS, for example, or your uh, Windows machine that you have. Um, it can be hosted at the NuGet Gallery, ProGet, MyGet, and other non-propriety free and paid products. Like, um, do you have an example, Paul? On the top of your uh... head? Well, anything that, that allows you to use a NuGet version 2 feed. So uh, one that jumps to mind is CloudSmith, which is, uh, I think they have free tiers, um, and it's definitely a paid tier as well, but that's a hosted solution. There's a number of no, um, free uh, non-hosted solutions, i.e. you would host it yourself. Um, there's, there's a one PHP something. Oh, they're, they're on the website. They're on the website. There's a whole load. Of, because it's NuGet version 2 feed, there's a you know there's lots and lots of software that supports that and the thing to kind of point out here is chocolatey does chocolatey has its uh, has its or had its own uh nougat version 2 software called chocolatey uh chocolatey server or simple server as we called it and um, we no longer support that because there's so many other options out there you know why would we do so but the, the point the thing to point out here is a Nougat version 2 feed is in a whole load of products. It's not proprietary chocolate. It's not saying, oh, you have to use our technology. There's all sorts of products that, that will actually support this. And two of the most popular that you've put there, Maurice, is Artifactory and Sonatype Nexus. Um, Artifactory is a paid product. Um, Sonatype Nexus has a free and a paid option um, mm -hmm. in there. But um, yeah, those are the two two most popular that, that we see. I want to point out. Sorry, I, I'm using Nexus on my Synology myself to, yeah. to host my own packages, so it works perfectly. Yeah, it's, I think uh, Nexus is Java based, so anything you can run Java on, really, you can run uh, Nexus on. But one of the things I was going to point out was that you can actually use, and we don't recommend this for organizations, but you can actually use a file share um, to do this or a folder on your machine. I actually have a folder on my computer, so when I'm out away doing presentations, um and i have to do demos then i spin up the machine um using a folder on on my computer yeah and the packages come from there because you can never you never know when you're away giving a presentation what the wi-fi or, or the general internet is like there so if you have everything on your own machine you can do that um and use that that local folder and that might work for if a small network perhaps yeah. we wouldn't recommend it but you can work for a small <laughs> network maybe a home network you've got three or four machines that might be that might work for you as well so uh, what a choc what is a chocolate package chocolatey package sorry uh, gary uh so a chocolate package at its heart is it's a fancy zip file um if you were to change the uh, file extension from nupkg to dot uh, zip then 
it will become a zip file that you can extract and you can see all the contents of it. Uh, but really what a uh, chocolate package brings to the table is it brings in uh, the metadata about that package. So what version uh, is this package? What dependencies does it have? What's the description? What's the summary? It's all of that information that you can't otherwise stamp onto a file uh, for, a, for, for a zip file, but that metadata gets added as a file within that zip file and uh, chocolate then knows how to what to do with that information. So that meta that metadata is the information about the uh, both the software and the underlying or, and the package that is um, that the what should I say? That's the metadata for both the software, the underlying installer, as well as the package that Chocolate is creating. Um, so within that. Um, we've kind of spoken around already, spoken around these already, but uh, within that package as well, there is uh, what I refer to as the chocolate automation scripts. So those are the scripts, the PowerShell scripts that do the actual work of the installation or the uninstallation of that that piece of software. Um, so those are uh, specifically named files. So there's the chocolate installed.ps1, the chocolate uninstalled.ps1, and the chocolate before modified.ps1. But within there it's literally PowerShell. You could do whatever you want to do within that script uh, that you want to do. Um, the, the other part of it is um, you, as you're, as you're stubbing out that PowerShell script, there's maybe things that the underlying installer doesn't do that you want it to do for that installation of that software. So an example would be, uh, if you needed to add an additional entry onto your path variable that the underlying MSI or EXE didn't do, you have the opportunity as you're running the PowerShell script to do that additional work. So you're essentially being able to allow to customize the application installer via the chocolatey package that is encapsulating it. Uh, and then add options missing from the installer argument. So uh, if the, you needed to do additional work uh, after the installation of the, the MSI or the EXE, again, that's your opportunity to do it within the, the, the chocolatey package itself. Like, and, like I did um, with the MySQL packages, um, when you install the MySQL package, it automatically generates the service in the, in the Windows services. So it can yeah. automatically start your service because the installer is just a, a zip file uh, with all the files for, for MySQL that, uh, that drops into place and, and, and basically does nothing other than you needing to you need to click on the MySQL executable to start it. Um, yeah. And you can provide a parameter to not do it, but by default, it will install the service for you. So it works automatically. Yep. Yeah. Um, so the final thing that can go into a chocolate package are files, um, and those could be any files. They could be arbitrary files. They could be Word documents. They could be PDFs. They could be whatever you need. Uh, but typically what they uh, they are are the actual application installers themselves. So while Chocolatey can perform the work of saying, I need to go to this URL, download this application installer, and install it for you, uh, you can actually create what we, what we refer to as an embedded chocolate package. So you actually take that MSI or that EXE and you put it inside that fancy zip file. So the, the benefit of that is that you've got a fully encapsulated uh, application package that could be installed that doesn't require any uh, connection to the outside world in order to to perform that operation. Now, Paul referred to the package internalizer, which is our, one of our paid for products that will create that embedded package for you from a non-embedded package. But if you as a, an individual or as an organization wanted to create your own embedded packages, then there's nothing to stop you doing that. Because again, it's just a fancy zip file. So you can put anything in there that you need. Um, so it, it's, it's, we've said this before, it's entirely flexible. It, you, can, you can literally do whatever you need to uh, as part of the, the process that you're trying to follow. So, um, like like we said before, um, uh, the possible sources can be a, any NuGet API v2 feed. Um, can be the public gallery, uh, meaning the chocolate community gallery, uh, repository. Sorry, um, can be Windows platform installer, Windows updates, Windows features, Ruby, Gems, Sigwin, and Python. Um, and one that's not in here, I think that will be the Windows features. Oh, that's there. Sorry. Um, yeah. So basically. Um, you can chocolate install Telnet, Telnet client uh, from the source Windows features, or you can install IIS Express from the WebPI, 
or any Ruby, Sequin, or Python package uh, directly from Chocolatey. And you can list all those packages with Chocolist, dash dash source, uh, and then Windows features or web PI or whatnot, whatever you need. Um, so now we go to the part where uh, Veeam comes into play. Um, Veeam and Chocolatey, yeah. Um, so I created for a lot of the Veeam products, I created Chocolatey packages. Um, for example, the Veeam backup application, um, those packages are available for the, the, the server. All the explorers, so that will be the explorer for Active Directory, SQL Server, Oracle, um, SharePoint, Teams, and I'm forgetting one. Um, they are all there that you can, can uh, install. The management console that you can install on your computer to uh, manage your VBR server from your computer instead of logging into the server, which you should not do. Um, and the catalog, um, the extract utility, which is a, quite a new one, uh, which is only the extract utility. So if you have uh, your backup files, you can use the extract utility to extract uh, a virtual machine from your backup file directly without the need of installing the Veeam backup or application uh, software. And um, the Veeam agent for Windows, we will come back to that one in a bit during the demo, but that's um, something you can install as well directly from Chocolatey. Um, Veeam one with the software, this is an, uh, available since April. Um, uh, in April 14th in 2020, um, I created those packages um, with an option to install the agent um, as well directly from Choco package uh, and in server mode for uh, using a specific parameter. Um, Veeam Backup for Microsoft 365, um, all the software that you need for, for installing a fully environment, uh, a fully uh, Microsoft 365 backup environment. You can do that rightly with Chocolate here as well. And really, really brand new is the Veeam Server Provider Console, which is a piece of software for uh, server providers, um, not for most users, um, but you can install that directly with Chocolate as well. You can find them all using the tag Veeam uh, on the community repository. Uh, maybe Gary can show that later in the, in the demo, um, where you can find them using the tag Veeam. But the link is in the presentation as well. The demo time, Gary, you uh, let me see, Gary Park, there you are. I will share this one. So everyone can share, see my screen? Yeah, yeah I can see great. your screen. So uh, this is a uh, VM that I spun up uh, earlier today. Uh, I've already pre-installed Chocolatey. Uh, the reason I did that was just to save a little bit of time because I didn't know how much we were going to have uh, to do the demo. But the install instructions are on the website. So you just go up to uh, chocolatey.org and click on the install button. And it's literally, it's a one line of PowerShell. So the idea is you just copy that uh, and paste that into uh, a administrative uh, PowerShell session and you will get Chocolate installed. So once you have Chocolate installed, the entry point for Chocolate E is the Choco command. So everything is done uh, based on the Choco command. So just running Choco proves that it's installed and tells me that I've got version uh, one to one installed. Now, if I wanted to know, for example, what, what packages do I have under Chocolate management? I can use the chocolate list command. So on there, that will tell me all of the packages that I have installed. So I've already pre-installed some packages in here just for testing things out. So for example, I installed the Google Chrome package. So that was a Choco install Google Chrome. So it's that familiarity, that consistent uh, entry point for all the operations that you're trying to do. The other one that's of uh, particular usage uh, sometimes is the Choco outdated command. So if I wanted to run, if I run Choco outdated, it'll look through all of the packages that I have installed and it'll tell me which ones are outdated based on the sources that I have available. So on my machine, as of right now, I don't have any packages that are out, out of date. Okay. Uh, question there from Drew is, uh, do we have to bypass PowerShell's execution policy each time? Uh, no, uh, that's simply for the in initial installation, and that was only on the uh, per process basis. That's not at a, um, 
that's not setting it uh, at the global level. That's just a one-off for the installation. So you know you don't need to do that every time. Good, good question though. Uh, so the example that uh, Maurice uh, spoke about is, well, let's say we wanted to install the Veeam uh, agent onto this machine. So I'm imagining on you would go to the Veeam website, you would go to download, you would click, you double click the installer, you would go next, 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 and you'd have the Veeam agent installed. But if I wanted to do that file. slightly differently via Chocolatey, what do I do? Um, so the, the command that I'm going to run uh, is I'm going to run a slightly different one, but I'll, I'll, I'll explain why that is in a second. I'm going to run Choco install Veeam agent with a specific version. And that's actually an older version of the Veeam agent, but I'm going to show how then we can use Chocolatey to uh, update that software as well. Um, so what this is prompting me for is I simply ran uh, Choco install. Now, going back to the point of being secure by default, Chocolatey will not do anything unless you've told it to do it and you're really sure that you want to do it. So in this scenario, it's saying, I'm going to run this script do I want? Do you want to see what that script contains, or do you want to just run it? So, uh, if you wanted to verify what Maurice is actually doing in this package, you actually have the opportunity to look at the script here, or you could actually look at it on the community repository as well. So, what I'm going to say is, I'm just going to say yes to this one. And but if you choose to, you could have passed dash y in as uh, the installation option, uh, or there is actually a global feature that allows you to always say yes. It really comes down to. Uh, how you want to run your installations. Again, that speaks back to the fact that Chocolate is flexible in the sense that you can tailor it to how you want it to do it. Now, I've before this demo, I already installed Veeam Agent at least once on this machine. So it already had all of the wired dependencies installed. So the Veeam package, I think, takes a dependency. Actually, we could go and look at that. So here's the Veeam Agent note. This screen is what Maurice was referring to. So if I've searched here for tag Veeam, so here are all the packages that are available on the Chocolate Community Repository uh, related to Veeam. And you'll see that it's Maurice's, name. it's Maurice's name that's associated with all of them. Um, but what I was going to show you was looking at a specific version uh, of the package, you can go into the dependencies on the website and you can see what those dependencies are. So in this scenario, when I did uh, Choco install Veeam agent before, it had already installed the, .NET, the, the required .NET Framework version. But now it's installed. So down in the bottom right here, where there wasn't before, we'll see that it's telling me that my backups haven't been configured. And if I go over here and I look for the Veeam agent for Windows, then you'll see that it is there and it's now running. So with one command, that was installed, provisioned, uh, and available on that machine, uh, ready to go. Uh, so I'm going to say that no, I don't want to uh, find a license file. I'm just going to go ahead and close that. But if I clear this out and I now run that command that I ran before, which was Choco outdated, it's going to go through the list of installed packages on this machine. And it's now going to say that there's actually a new version of the Veeam agent available. So what I could do is I could do Choco upgrade, uh, if I can spell, I could do Choco upgrade Veeam agent to do a specific upgrade of that one package. Or I could actually say, well, I want you to upgrade all of the outdated packages that are on my machine. So I can do a Choco upgrade all. And because this time round, I'm going to say uh, dash Y uh, ahead of time, I won't be prompted for the information, uh, the, the, uh, the suggestion that I need to uh, verify that. I've already said that I'm really sure that I want to install it. So at this point, it's going to rerun that installation. It's going to download that Veeam installer package or the Veeam, back, uh, Veeam agent package. It's then going to execute it. And then I'm going to have that uh, application upgraded on my machine uh, ready for usage. So we like to think that that particular uh, feature uh, is really useful uh, in the sense that you can get a, uh, a top level view of your uh, environment or your machine, uh, what's updated, what needs to be updated. And then depending on whether you, you're using a configuration management system like Paul spoke about earlier, or you're using some of our offerings, our business offerings, you can help keep those machines up to date with all the latest, latest software by uh, using the auditing features that come uh, out of the box with Chocolatey to know what's installed, what's outdated, and what uh, what can be upgraded. So but that, Gary, when it's finished, yep. But this is all command line. Um, and uh, I know I, we, we the three of us like from command line, but I, I can imagine a lot of people in the, in the, in the chat and in the, in, the, in the meeting currently do not like command line. Um, would there be another option? Other than just using command line. 
there is. And that was going to be my next thing I was just going to talk about. So um, I was waiting for this to finish. And then I was going to show you uh, what we call chocolate gooey. Now, some people have suggested that it should have been called gooey chocolatey or gooey chocolate. But we ended up going with chocolatey gooey. Uh, so from the command line, uh, I can type chocolatey gooey because I already have that installed. But if you wanted it, it would just be choco install uh, chocolatey gooey. And because it's an application, you can obviously find that from the start menu as you normally would as well. But what this provides is a, uh, a user interface that sits on top of chocolatey. So under the hood, chocolatey gooey is just orchestrating uh, the chocolatey commands, but it's giving you in a visual format. So in this, in this scenario, uh, uh, the first thing that I see is what packages do I have installed on this PC? So this, what you're seeing here, is the exact same as the chocolate list uh, local that I did earlier, but it's just the visual representation of that. But if I wanted to install a specific package, then I can go to what sources do I have available. So this chocolatey source is the default uh, chocolate community repository, and these are all the packages that I could install. So if I wanted to install Firefox, then I would have the option of right-clicking and install, uh, or if I double-click on it, then I will get uh, additional information about that package, uh, the description, all the information that you get from the website, and you would have here the uh, install again, or if you wanted to do an advanced install, where you might want to provide some additional command line arguments as you can at the command line, you can do that from the user interface as well. So there's a couple of ways of doing that. Uh, so to show that in action, uh, let's just pick, actually, let's just pick Firefox. So I'm just going to right click and install that Firefox package. And then I'm going to see a similar output that I would see from the command line, but I'm seeing it within the user interface. And what I'm going to get from then, what I'll have then uh, is that Firefox package and the underlying Firefox application installed and usable on that machine. So we're trying to cater to both uh, people, those that like the command line, those that don't like the command line. Uh, and so a question pop up, can this uh, GUI just manage the PC on which it's installed or can it be used to manage a bunch of PCs and servers? Uh, that's a great question, uh, Hen. Uh, in its current format, Chocolate GUI uh, is for the machine that it's currently installed on. Uh, it doesn't know anything about any uh, of the other PCs within your environment. Uh, we do have an offering uh, that's called the Chocolate Central Management, and that's a centralized location where you can find out uh, all of the packages uh, that are installed on any machine that's within your environment. Uh, and then if you wanted to, you could create a deployment to say, go ahead and upgrade the, these packages on these machines uh, or install this new application or package on this, these set of machines. Uh, so that's one of our business features, but you can absolutely do that today uh, through, Chocolate, uh, the, through the Chocolate ecosystem, yes. Uh, the other thing that you can do through Chocolate GUI is do some of the configuration side of things. So if you can go into the settings here, and you configure both the settings and features for Chocolatey GUI and for Chocolatey itself. Uh, so if you want to enable and disable certain features, you can absolutely do that through the UI. Uh, and then if you want to configure an additional source, we spoke about that earlier. So if you wanted to have your own uh, internal Nexus repository or your own internal uh, artifactory server, you could come in here and create a new source that would mean that Chocolatey would then uh, use that source to find the packages that it would want to install uh, or what it wanted to do. Uh, so all of the all of the, these settings and configurations you can do from the command line. But again, depending on where you land, you either prefer the UI or you, or you prefer the command line. But we're we're, we're catering to both uh, both folks that want those things. Uh, so I think that was all I had to demo uh, specifically. Uh, so if there's any other uh, things you want to show, I'm I'm happy to uh, take those on, uh, or we can go to the next uh, slide if you want. Yeah, I think I think we'll go back to the presentation now. Let me start my share of my screen. Um, yep, I think you should be seeing the demo PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, okay, perfect. So that leads us to the last one, and that will be the questions part. Um, we did have the question from let me see, Eric. How does Chocolatey compare to Winget, Paul? I think that's a, a great question for you. Uh, yeah, I, 
we we get asked this question. I said a lot, but we actually we get asked it. Um, I think the first thing to say really is that Chocolate is a package manager um, as opposed to Wingate, which isn't. Um, while um, Microsoft tell you it's a package manager, it's not a package manager, it's a software manager. It doesn't manage packages, it manages software. So Chocolatey manages packages. Um, and when we talk about that, uh, we say that Chocolatey manages packages, packages manage installers, Chocolatey does not manage installers. Okay. Um, so we've talked a lot about um, Paint.net being one, Google Chrome's or another one. I talked about um, license keys and I talked about zips and, you know, I talked about all of that. But these are all packages on your machine, which Chocolatey manages. Those packages are all versioned, um, you know, and Chocolatey can install those packages. They can It can upgrade those packages. It can uninstall those packages. And then those packages can install software, upgrade software, uninstall software, or other things, as I said, license keys, all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of the fundamental there, um, the, the first big thing. Um, the other thing I would say is that um, you know, the repository type, as we mentioned earlier on, that Chocolate uses is a Nougat version 2 uh, feed that is a present in a huge number of software applications. And um, we mentioned two of the most, uh, the biggest ones, the most common ones we use was Artifact and Sony Type Nexus. So Chocolatey can use those. It can use the community repository we've talked about. It can use a folder on your machine. All of them um, as sources um, for where your package is stored. It can use uh, it can uh, use a Python source, WebPy, Windows features. You know those other things we talked about as well. Um, you, we're talking about the the automation side of things. You know, Wingate and Chocolate are, are, are similar in those respects in that, um, you know, they can install, as I said, Wingate in case it will install that software. Chocolate will install those packages. Um, but the big differentiator between the two um, is that Chocolate Community Repository has, as you, you said, um, as of yesterday, Maurice, has got 9,700 packages on there. And over, I don't know what it was, versions of that, 170,000 versions of those packages. That is the biggest um, software repository um, available, um, you know, for, okay, for all, um, for, for Windows package managers. Now, you'll use that term kind of loosely. Um, I think it was the one before that. Yeah, we got we go. I was right, hey, uh, 170,000. So that's a huge amount of software that Chocolatey has available um, as well. Chocolatey doesn't want to lock you into uh, using uh, a particular ecosystem. So, you know, as Gary mentioned, your Chocolatey package is a fancy zip file that's, again, a Nougat package um, that, that, you know, is pre you know, that, that, that format is pre-existing. Chocolatey took that and expanded upon it. Um, and made it that you can then um, use those packages um, with that format within Chocolate itself, so on those non-proprietary um, repository managers. Um, you know, so there's there's a, there's differences, there's nuances between the actual how the, the software works, and you get different switches and parameters and things. But those for me are the the, the differences that that jump out as well um from our business side of things we've got i've mentioned package internalizer we talked about that gary mentioned chocolate central management that allows you to control all of your your uh, the software on your nodes um end nodes so let's say you've got 100,000 machines chocolate central management will be able to get your reports on those what software is outdated create deployments for new software you want to put on there upgrades but those deployments actually don't have to be chocolatey things so you're not just upgrading and maintaining packages you can run PowerShell scripts in there as well and then kind of uh, arbitrary PowerShell code so you might want to go onto a machine and get uh what's the registry say you've got a, a, a line of business application or some proprietary application you use in your organization and it sets a registry key and you need to know the value of that registry key for whatever reason you can go and query that and get that information back from those machines as well and be able to see that um you can then maybe maybe it's a license thing you can see how many licenses you've got there from from those deployments as well um so I, I got, why, I got, sorry, sorry i got the the the, the uh luxury to try and play around with the with um, uh, central management and it's really really powerful um, for example I, I i used to install my monitoring software zabbix uh, agent uh, using a bash script uh, which was quite annoying and, and not maintainable and not upgradable and i switched to the uh, msi installer that's on the chocolatey community repository and i was able to create a script 
in PowerShell to remove the old version and install the new version with all the parameters that you need that I, I, I wanted to provide and automatically update the, the uh, Zabbix agent on all my machines without need to uh, log into every machine and do the thing on every machine and over and over and over again. So it's it's really powerful and it's really capable to in doing a lot of things. And, and, and it sounds like as well, it saved you a huge amount of time from yeah, having to do exactly. you kind of manually or on those individual machines. Um, so to, to kind of wrap up that that question is, if Winget works for you, use Winget. If chocolatey works for you, use chocolatey. You know, we're not here to say, oh, you must use chocolate. You use whatever tool works best for you. We're all about saving time. We're all about automation. We're all about making sure that our organizations run smoother, faster, quicker, and we have less of the the, the busy work to do, a bit more productive work. Um, and we should use the tools that work for us and work for us within our organizations as well. Are there uh, any the other thing, questions? I, the only thing I'd Sorry. add to that, just if uh, I remember, is last time I checked, uh, Wingate uh, only works on client operating systems. It doesn't work on server operating systems. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that, Paul. Um, so that's, no, a, that's kind of a great. distinguishing feature in the sense that uh, chocolatey works everywhere. Um, as long as you have a baseline at the minute of uh, .NET Framework 4.0 and PowerShell 2, uh, then chocolatey is installable and usable uh, on those environments. Now, you might run into some strangeness with regard to uh, TLS versions uh, when trying to communicate with some uh, external sources, but that's just security moving on. That's not um, anything to do with chocolatey necessarily. And so so basically chocolatey works from uh, Windows Server 2008, I think. R2 and up. in Azure. R2, yeah. So, so we support whichever versions Microsoft supports. So Windows Server 2008 R2 in Azure. You've got to put the in Azure bit because my, Windows Server 2008 R2 is end of life, but Microsoft continue to support it in Azure, so we continue to support it as well. Um, now, Gary said you, you might get, if you're using the community repository from that, you'll probably get some issues around about TLS and things like that. People use it with Windows 7, and we don't officially support that, but it does work. Again, you might get some issues around the TLS versions, but if you're using an internal repository or even a folder in your own machine, you won't have that issue. Um, but we also support, you know, versions. Uh, I think a Winget requires Windows 10, a certain level of Windows 10. I can't remember what it is, 1709 or 18. I think Windows 10 and, 10 and 11 only. Uh, yeah, but there's a version of Windows 10, is it 1709 yeah, or something like that? It was. Something like that. Um, whereas we support, as, as Gary said, we support all the way back to Windows Server 2008 R2 and Windows 8.1 on the client. So, um, yeah, as long as you've got a minimum of PowerShell 2 on there, um, you, 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 you'll be able to install Chocolate um, and you'll be able to use it. But in earlier ones that are not supported, there'll be some caveats there. But that, as Gary said, that's down to Windows and not, not Chocolate. Yeah. So. We have we have time for one more question and here's a question from Michael. Um, does it handle license management or is it smart enough to install a license software and remove it from a user's workstation if it's revoked, either tie into Active Directory or some other system? Uh, so the short answer is no. Uh, Chocolatey out the box doesn't know anything about any uh, license management tools or license management uh, quotas that you have on your system. Um, but that's not to say that it can't know about those things. So Maurice uh, referred to uh, hook packages or hook scripts earlier uh, in the presentation. So there'll be nothing to stop you having a uh, hook package that was specific to your environment that said, uh, how many licenses of this uh, application do I have installed across my environment, wherever you store that information. And then Chocolatey using that information could then say, well, I can or can't install this package onto this workstation. Whether you could then revoke it, um, again, Chocolatey out the box at that point, maybe not. Um, and hook scripts wouldn't necessarily help in that scenario either. But if you were integrating with a configuration management system or within Chocolate Central Management, you could take actions to ensure compliance of uh, those uh, installed packages by uh, sending out a deployment that said, well, you need to remove that application from this machine or this group of machines. So there would be ways and means of doing it, but there's nothing out of the box currently that would provide that sort of functionality, no. Okay, I think that is um, 
all the time that we have currently for um, th this presentation. Um, I want to thank you all that joined us today um, for, uh, for, for, for this presentation. And uh, I, I want to thank Paul and Gary for joining me on this uh, presentation as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for all the massive 